Uh, other people have talked about mouse traps. In particular, there's a man named Ken Miller. Uh, he's a professor of biology at uh, Brown University. Ken Miller is one of your antagonists. He is one that's written in scientific journals about uh, yes. TTSS, yes? Yes. And explain what that is very quickly. Uh, TTSS is the type 3 secretory system. It's, uh, it's a subpart of the flagellum. The flagellum, I told you, has to build itself. This thing called the type 3 secretory system can uh, pump out the parts of the flagellum out through a hollow tube where they can assemble uh, themselves. So it can act as a protein pump or a, uh, a, a a uh, pump uh, for the parts of the flagellum. And what he's really getting at is that what he's saying is if we can show that this uh, TTSS is a secretory, uh, what was it, I'm sorry? A pump. It's a, a pump. pump. Uh -huh. and it's, it's a building block, okay, uh -huh. of a part of the complex structure that makes up the bacteria flagellum. Uh -huh. And his point is if we see this in other um, cells or other uh, mechanics within cells and it's pushing itself forward because TTSS appears in other uh, type cells, mm -hmm. then there's evidence that maybe it could have evolved to this place. Yes. Now, now th I want you to respond to that because I know that sometimes uh, a lot of the folks that are your antagonists get to write and put their opinions in journals, and when you try and respond, your articles are... They're deemed un uninteresting. <laughs> yes, or, or, or rejected. Yeah, they're... they're and, th which gets to a question out. I want to ask you. The, the disclaimer you gave at the beginning, was that your idea or... Uh, do powers that be suggest strongly that you give it? Well, a little bit of both. Uh, powers that be thought it would be a good idea, and, and I agreed with them. Because some of, you have to realize that in the scientific community, I don't get as many laughs as I get here. Uh, and, and my colleagues were getting static because of the crazy guy down the hall from them. Uh, and they were getting emails from other people asking if Lehigh University had, was turning itself into a Bible college and graduate students from Lehigh who were going out for postdoctoral interviews were being laughed at because I am at Lehigh. You're on the faculty. And I'm on the faculty there. So and This uh, is a lot of what the movie Expelled really is about. Is yes, about. It's yes. about some of the pressures within the scientific community to, you know, I think what they say is the science of intelligent design is neither intelligent nor science. Yeah, they, they do that, <laughs> they say very strongly, uh, but they don't have any more reason for it than I've been showing you with some of the responses to my uh, Exactly, to my so, so it gets to an ad hominem or, or to the man. They, they, yes. they make these statements, they call it science in yes. a cheap tuxedo, and yet when the evidence for that claim are brought forward, uh, they don't stand well on the stage up against it. No, that, that's correct. Uh, I mean, I'm trying to show the best uh, responses to, uh, to my arguments, and, and as you can see, they're, they're just, not, uh, just not that uh, impressive. Uh, but nonetheless, uh, somebody will bang a gavel, as the judge says, and said, no, you're, you know, you're clearly, uh, you know, you're clearly uh, not scientific, you know, you, you go away. Uh, it's, it's more or less like uh, people in the Soviet Union a long time ago who uh, objected to communism, they were put in mental institutions because if you didn't think communism was the right system, clearly you were not functioning uh, very well. Uh, it's, it's, it's very similar to that. Or you were exiled to a very cold, place. lonely place, <laughs> which is, is, is a little bit of what's happening. I want to come back this a little bit. I want to get Steve back up here to talk about the evidence for intelligent design within the digital code. One last question before we move. How do I get a subscription to that Cell magazine? It just looks absolutely <laughs> riveting. Uh, just, just write to MIT Press. Okay, and be... thank you. So uh, that was uh, flooding in on our text line, <laughs> and I wanted to go ahead and get to that, uh, if I could. Okay. All right, let's, let's yield to Steve, mm -hmm. and then we'll come back up, and uh, we might look at Mr. Miller's tie clip, or <laughs> do you want to you mm -hmm. give a quick uh, explanation of what that slide was since they got a peek at it, and will Steve come out here and be ready to go as soon as you're done? Uh, yeah, Kenneth Miller says, well, I can take away a piece, and it won't function as a mousetrap anymore, but I can use it as a tie clip. <laughs> yeah, you can, but you can't use it as a mousetrap anymore, and that's the point of irreducible complexity, and I was going to go into great detail about that, but I, I guess I won't. <laughs> All right. Well, we are, we are honored that you're here. Uh -huh. um, <laughs> okay. One of the, one of the uh, 
One of the reasons I'm uh, just grateful that, that Mike is here, Mike is a father of nine children. And uh, so. clearly he's figured out the uh, lack of complexity in the mating process. <laughs> and that's a whole lot more fun than playing with mousetraps. Amen, brother? <laughs> Uh, let's, uh, <laughs> now, with that, <laughs> Steve, talk about the evidence for uh, design inside the code. And why don't you do this? Build this bridge, because when most of us laymen think of a black box, we think of that which is indestructible inside a plane. And, and that's not the black box that, uh, that Mike was talking about. He was talking about Darwin could not see what was inside the cell. He believed that in fact, if the cell was as complex as it was today, he may never have written the book. He would have surrendered at that point in saying, there is such genius inside of that. It, in fact, violates what he wrote as, in that one uh, quote that you had from Origin of Species. So let's go further now, not just in the complex machinery that Mike talked about. Let's talk about even a step beyond, which is the digital code embedded in that. There's it's a segue. It's necessary to build it. There we Absolutely. go. Absolutely. And hey, Mike, we're not used to getting that kind of a reaction. How did you warm them up like that? <laughs> um, all right. I'm, uh, I'm here to talk about the digital code. I hope we get to talk a little bit more about that type 3 secretory thing later because uh, I've been working with one of, Mike one of Mike's colleagues who's a microbiologist who's been defending Mike's honor because that. Uh, there's a, there's a genetic story behind that objection that I think has shown Mike to be entirely correct, but maybe we can come back to that in Q&A. Uh, my job tonight is to talk about the, uh, I think, one of the most fascinating discoveries in the history of, of humankind, not just science, but it's, it is the discovery that Watson and Crick made of the digital code in DNA. The first thing they discovered in 1953 was the beautiful double helix structure of DNA. We all know this, this structure because it, it's, a, it's a cultural icon now. We know that DNA, uh, you convict criminals with their DNA. We see, we see DNA on all, all kinds of things. The, the double helix is, is an icon, but it, it's, it's a beautiful structure. But more important than the structure that Watson and Crick discovered is the, 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 the mystery that they solved and the mystery that they created. The first line of the book that I've, I've just completed is this. It's when Watson and Crick discovered the, the, the elucidated, the structure of the DNA molecule, they solved one mystery, but they created another. The mystery that they solved was the mystery of where hereditary information arises. Since ancient times, people have known that like begets like, that children are like their parents, that organisms are able to copy and replicate themselves in very similar form. And scientists have, have known that there must be some kind of signal, some sort of memory or, uh, that, that allows organisms to reproduce themselves. But where does that memory, that information, that signal re reside? Uh, when Watson and Crick discovered the structure of DNA, there was a hint in the structure that suggested that the DNA not only has this beautiful helix, but it is embedding some kind of information down its spine. It was suggested by Watson and Crick in their very first paper that this might be the case. But in 1957, four years later, uh, Francis Crick, having taken stock of all the developments that were going on, not only in the DNA chemistry world, but also in the world of protein chemistry, put forward what I think is the, the, really the basis of modern biology, which is the sequence hypothesis. And in it, he said that there, there are four chemical characters along the spine of the DNA. They're called bases or nucleotide bases that function just like alphabetic letters in a written text or digital characters in a piece of machine code or software. This is known as the sequence hypothesis. According to Crick, it's not the chemical properties of these, these, uh, these bases that is important. Rather, it's their arrangement. Just as it's important, it's not important uh, what the, the, the weight or the, the composition of these Scrabble letters is, what's important is the way they're arranged to spell out a message. It's the sequence of the arrangement that's, that it determines the function, not whether, it's on, whether the letters are put on wood or, 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 or tile or plastic. Um, this was the sequence hypothesis. And here, here's a picture uh, of the DNA molecule. You see the double helix shape that's the, made of the sugar phosphate backbone on the outside. That's the medium of, of the genetic text, the genetic information. But the information is stored on the inside of the molecule 
in virtue of the specific arrangement of these, these particular characters. These, we represent them with A's, C's, G's, and T's. There are four different chemicals, and it's the arrangement of those chemicals, again, that determines the function of the molecule. Now, that's all well and good, but what exactly does DNA do? And Watson Crick said that the, the characters function like alphabetic uh, letters in a written text or like digital characters in a machine code. That's great, but what does the machine code do? What, uh, what do those instructions tell the cell to do? Well, right as Watson and Crick were elucidating the structure and the function of DNA, well, the structure of DNA, there was a parallel development in molecular biology in the area of protein chemistry. It started in the, about the same time, 1952, a scientist named Fred Sanger was discovering uh, about the protein uh, insulin. Other scientists began to, to, to discover the three-dimensional structure of proteins and that they, did, they discovered that they were immensely complex, three-dimensional shapes. Just, it, it defied everybody's expectation. They thought proteins were going to be simple things like hat boxes stacked up on top of each other. The ultimate secret of life, after all, should be law-like and orderly. But proteins weren't like that. We know that proteins do, and they knew that proteins did lots of important jobs in the cell. You can think of proteins as like the toolbox of the cell. Inside the cell, or, or in a toolbox, you've got a hammer, a, a, a wrench, uh, a saw, you've got a plane, all these things have perform functions and they perform the specific functions they do in part because of the specific shapes they have. The same thing is true of proteins. They have very irregular, complicated shapes and in virtue of those shapes, the proteins are able to do specific jobs in the cell. Here's just a simple illustration. You have a protein that acts as an enzyme, it catalyzes a reaction, in this case a reaction that breaks apart two sugar molecules. But the ability to break apart that disaccharide depends on a very precise three-dimensional fit between these two molecules. The disaccharide nestles into those two grooves in this particular enzyme. And everything in biology works according to that same kind of specificity of fit. Proteins make up the the structural parts of those nanomachines that Mike Behe was talking about, all those parts in the bacterial flagellar motor and other nanomachines are made of proteins. They fit together and form the machine because of very precise hand and glove fit between the parts. Same thing is true for enzymes catalyzing reactions. Same thing is true for proteins that help process the information in the cell. All proteins function because of this very precise three-dimensional specificity. How do they acquire that specificity? Well, we now know it has a, a hand and glove fit, another, another take on specificity. Uh, we now know that proteins acquire that specificity because of the way their individual subunits are arranged. Now, the subunits of proteins, that sounds like a big scientific word, but hey, I've got snap lock beads tonight. <laughs> Ages two to four, it says on the box, okay. <laughs> All my best visual aids are stolen from small children, you know, <laughs> okay. Um, okay, here's a, a protein is a, a long chain like molecule that folds into a very specific shape. And it might fold differently depending on the arrangement of the subunits, the amino acids. So each of these colored beads with a different shape represents a different amino acid. And you can see that there's a lot of different ways that we could arrange even just these few beads. Depending upon the arrangement, the shape will be different it will fold in the protein, or the, the, the chain will fold into either a functional protein, or it may lay, lie limp and, and do nothing at all if the arrangement isn't correct. So the amino acids, and there'll be a, a test on this particular, these equations afterwards, um, the amino acids are sequenced in very particular ways so that the protein folds in the right, in, in the right way. Get the, get the sequencing wrong, you don't get a functional protein. So, so uh, Francis Crick, in fact, said that that uh, he likened the amino acids to those old um, typeface blocks that are used in the, um, in the old newspaper headlines. It, it, they all have the same basic chemical structure, but there's a different sticky outie with each one, a different font, and those, the arrangement of those sticky outies determines the, more technical terms, sorry, and it determines the, the folding and therefore the function. Okay, so we, we like to say that, that amino acids have a property, or proteins have a property called sequence specificity. If something has sequence specificity, the function of the whole de de is determined by the specific arrangement of the parts. We find that in language, we find that in computer codes, we find it in, in proteins. But the question is, 
how do proteins acquire that specificity? And this is where, where Francis Crick's sequence hypothesis came in. According to, to, to Crick, the characters along the DNA spine function like alphabetic letters, but the, what, they're, what they're spelling, what, the, what they're, they're causing to happen is the sequencing of amino acids, which in turn cause the proteins to fold and therefore produce a functional tool in the, in the cell's toolkit. So information on DNA is transcribed, translated, and produces this, the, the functional outcomes, the, the, the protein machines that, that the cell needs to survive. So you've got a form of functional information, sometimes referred to as machine code or assembly instructions in the DNA molecule. Now, this is what I call the DNA enigma. And I, would, I, I, said, I said at the beginning of my book that Watson Crick solved one part of that enigma. They solved the question of where the information, where biological information resides. It resides along the spine of the DNA molecule. They also helped us with the sequence hypothesis to understand what that information does it helps, it, it, it directs uh, the building of proteins, but it raised another, their discovery raised another even more profound mystery. And that mystery is, where did that information come from? Where did it come from? Now that's an important mystery for two reasons. First, because we know in our own digital world something about information and its importance. If, I actually used to ask my students, if you want to give your computer a new function, what do you have to give it? Software, code. Well, the same thing is true in life. If you want to build a new organism from an earlier, simpler organism, or if you want to build life in the first place from simpler chemicals, you have to arrange the parts in very particular ways to make functional organisms. To, to provide new biological function, you also need information. Same principle is in the software world. And that, that is a, a profound code is necessary to build new form and function in biology, just as it is in, in, in high technology. Now that raises a really, that, that uh, creates a, a profound dilemma. Because there's, a, there's a, a question that scientists almost universally agree has not been solved by any materialistic theory of evolution. We can debate about whether Darwinian evolution is true or not, but I'm going to set that aside for tonight. And, and look at a more fundamental issue. If you think of Darwin's great tree of life as representation of the history of life, all the things out on the branches, the giraffes and the dolphins and the, uh, the, the, uh, the, uh, the birds and the fishes and, and us and, and plants, uh, all of those things represent, are the modern forms of life. But if you go back far enough, according to Darwin, you get to the simple organism that is the, the progenitor of all life. And he, he and other scientists have usually conceived of that as some kind of simple cell. Sometimes this is called amoeba to man evolution. That's not quite accurate, but you get the idea, okay? But the question that is raised by um, the recognition of the centrality of information is one, how do you make those transitions from one form to another, given that you need a lot of information, but to, to, to provide any new function, any new form, but an even more fundamental question and which is the one I'll talk about now, is well, how do you get life in the first place? To, to, life depends on information. DNA runs the show in even the simplest cell. It directs the construction, the proteins, that even the simplest cells need to survive. So where did that information come from? Watson and Crick did not answer that question, but a Crick in particular appreciated the gravity of the question. Now, I first came across what I, this, the second question, the, the, what I call the DNA enigma, here in Dallas. I happened to be working here in the early 80s. I was uh, right out of school. I was a geophysicist for an oil company. And I learned to speak some, some good old company Texan. I was looking for all out in the guff. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and you know how we spell all down here. It's A-H-L, all right? And, uh, and so I had no inkling of this debate. I wasn't involved in this kind of thing. I was doing practical applied science. I was looking at doing digital signal processing of seismic surveys. Interesting stuff. But one day in February of 18... Uh, 19, <laughs> <laughs> That's the other anniversary. Uh, February of 1985, I walked into a conference literally off the street. I'd heard about the night before at the Dallas Hilton downtown. It was a conference that had been funded by a Dallas businessman named William Garrison. If he's here tonight or in town, all I can say is you have no idea what you set in motion. And uh, Mr. Garrison funded this conference. It was a conference of, of people who held a materialistic worldview and people who held a theistic worldview, but these weren't ordinary people. 
These were Nobel Prize winners. They were the top cosmologists, origin of life scientists, and people who did neuroscience. The three questions they were addressing were the origin of the universe, the origin of life, and the origin of human consciousness. And the conference literally changed my life. I walked in, I sat down, and there was Alan Sandage in the first session announcing how he had become a religious believer because of the evidence of the new cosmology which pointed to the beginning of the universe. He had originally been slated to speak on the side of the materialist atheist position and had unceremoniously walked across to sit with the other guys. Um, in the next session that afternoon, uh, there, was a con uh, there, there was a discussion of the origin of life. There was some apparently young upstarts in the discussion, a, 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 a local chemist named Charles Thaxton, who had written an important book called The Mystery of Life's Origin. Um, and he was on the panel with Walter Bradley, a very established professor of thermodynamics and polymer scientist from Texas A&M. On the other side of the panel were leading origin of life researchers. But someone had joined Thaxton and Bradley that was completely unexpected as well. His name was Dean Kenyon. He had uh, uh, published the leading chemical evolutionary theory about the origin of life in a book called Biochemical Predestination. It was the leading college-level text on how life started from simple chemicals. At this conference, he announced publicly that for the first time that he no longer believed his own theory. In fact, he explained why it wouldn't work. And he went on to express support for something he called the design hypothesis. And he said that he agreed with Thaxton and Bradley that the information that was required to build the cell pointed powerfully to a designing intelligence. Now, when he said that, well, you can't say this in a church, but all something broke loose. I mean, it was unbelievable. <laughs> um, it was, it was, the reaction to this was part of what intrigued me, because up to that point, everyone agreed, there was no doubt about this, that the state of origin of life biology was at its, uh, in a state of impasse. Everyone agreed that there was no evolutionary, undirected evolutionary process that could explain the origin of the complexity of the cell, and in particular, this crucial information problem. Uh, by the way, nothing has changed on that. If you saw the movie Expelled last year, you saw at the very end of the film, uh, Richard Dawkins, who is not known for his uh, restraint and expression of support for evolutionary theory, acknowledged that no one knows how life first originated, and he, what, he meant no one knows from an evolutionary point of view. I was a young scientist, I heard this conversation, and I was absolutely intrigued. And afterwards, a local guy introduced me to, to Charlie Thaxton, and Thaxton uh, was uh, you know, kind of unassuming and friendly. I thought, man, he'd been to Harvard, I was really kind of in, intimidated, but uh, he invited me to come see him after work. And we started talking, and over the course of the next six months, he mentored me. And I learned more and more about this subject, and I couldn't wait to get to grad school to, to study it, and fortunately, the Atlantic Richfield uh, Company made a way for that to happen by laying me off. Uh, it was, if you remember 1985, if you're oil company people, you remember what happened to the price of oil, and all the young bucks just were given very generous, but uh, severance packages. So a year later, I found myself on my way to England. I was fortunate enough to get a rotary scholarship from the good people here in Dallas, and I was in Cambridge my first year, and that's where I stayed to end up, do my, end up doing my doctoral work, and I worked on this question of the origin of life. I was intrigued by Thaxton's ideas, but he floated them not in a full book-length treatment or an argument, he floated them in, an, in a short epilogue, making a suggestive, kind of intuitive case that, that information is, seems to be the kind of thing that comes from intelligent agents. And he said, we know that based on our uniform experience. But uh, he didn't develop this, and I was fascinated by this, and I was also fascinated by this, this general question, this DNA enigma. Here we had, in the, in, the, in the shape of the DNA, the information in, in life, we had a, a, a feature that everyone agreed looked designed. Digital code, even Richard Dawkins says it's like a machine code, and it's uncannily computer-like, he said, and, but no one had an undirected process that they even claimed could mimic the powers of a designing intelligence to produce that appearance of design. So if you've got an appearance of design and no designer substitute mechanism to explain it, Maybe there's evidence of actual design. And I got intrigued. Could, but I wanted to know about the other theories. Were there other approaches that could explain this? And as I began to, as I began to work on this topic during my PhD research in England, I started to realize, I, what I came to realize was that this DNA was deeper and far more profound than I had any inkling of when I first encountered this conference or even in my discussions with Dr. Thaxton. Um, and I, what I discovered is that there were three basic approaches that scientists had, had taken to try to explain this DNA enigma. 
And the, the first was just the kind of the raw bootstrap, you know, seat of the pants. Let's, let's try it by chance. And uh, there was a famous French scientist who was a colleague of Francis Crick's, Jacques Minot. And he, he, he wrote a book called Chance and Necessity. And he said the, 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 the basic job of the scientist is to explain everything by reference to chance, random variations, random processes, or necessity, by which he meant natural laws. If I drop a wallet here and it falls to the ground, we'll say that that happened because of the law of gravity, and scientists will say that, therefore, that happened by necessity. It was lawful. It had to happen that way. And, and Minot basically said, that's, that's what scientists should do. We should explain things by chance and necessity. And so I thought, well, how have, how, how have scientists fared at explaining the DNA enigma the information necessary to produce the first life by reference to chance, necessity, or as Minot said, sometimes we combine them, the, the combination of the two. Well, so let's look at these briefly, and you'll see why I think this is such a profound mystery from the standpoint of the materialistic evolutionary approach to the origin of life. The first, the first approach is chance, and there's a basic problem here that uh, was almost universally recognized, and it's the problem of the complexity of the cell, but it, there's a mathematical dimension to it. If you're a person of mathematical, computational, computer background, you know about combinatorials and how, how the, well, let me illustrate. If you've got, um, back to my snap lock beads here, the, these, these represent the amino acids. There are 20 possible protein-forming amino acids that could attach to a growing chain that would build a protein at any given site. So if you have just two, pro, uh, two amino acids linking together, how many possible combinations are there? Uh, I heard a couple of math guys say 400, and that's right. Our intuition is always it's 20 plus 20, right? But no, if you think that each one can combine with 20 others, and there are 20 possibilities on each, on each, at each site, it's actually 20 times 20. Now let's go and we'll, let's just say, let's add another amino acid to the chain. Now how many possibilities are there? Man, this is a smart audience. Okay, okay. I, I was still starting to rev up the mental math, you know. Okay, so now a fourth. What do we get? 160,000, right? Okay, and on and on. What's happening to these numbers? Are they building just, are they, are, is this just, go, are they going up in an additive fashion or a geometric or exponential fashion? Okay, exponential. Now, here's, I'm going to look really smart because I already figured this out. Okay, <laughs> all right. A, a modest length protein is going to be in the order of 150 amino acids long. The, the cell needs many proteins that are much longer than that, the, the gigantic polymerases, for example. Um, but, but let's just take a modest length protein of 100, 150 amino acids long. Now, what, what, think of the combinatorial problem that we have. That's the, num the number of possible arrangements of amino acids that you could generate. 20 times 20 times 20 times 20 times 20, out to the 150th power. 20 to the 150th is also, now this is where I get to look smart, 10 to the 195th power. I worked that out on my little calculator beforehand. Um, but the point is, that's an unimaginably large number. Now, you can quibble about that, and you can notice that there are more than, there's more than just one functional protein, and that's correct. So that adjusts the numbers downward. But then you also have to take into account that <clears throat> there's only a certain kind of linkage that can take place chemically, and the odds of that are only one and two at each site. And there's only one kind of amino acid, a left-handed, not a right-handed kind. And so when you take it all into account, here's the bottom line. The number of combinations of possibilities vastly dwarfs the number of possible events there could have been since the very beginning of the universe, since the Big Bang. There are only 10 to the 80th elementary particles. There are only 10 to the 16th seconds since the beginning of the universe. There's only so fast that interactions can take place between molecules. So think of it this way. All the number of combinations that could possibly be, be represent a vast haystack grander than the size of the entire universe, and what we're looking for is something like a tiny, tiny needle smaller than the smallest elementary particle. And we have to find that in a blind, undirected search, all right? Most scientists working on the origin of life have realized that the, that the complexity of the cell, the combinatorial complexity, is so great that we will never, ever find life in, in that way, in that way. Through time plus chance. Through time plus what chance. What you're saying is statistical improbability giving the grandest, uh, uh, I guess, uh, number that is presented as a probability for the existence of the universe, which is right around 
billion years right now, I've read recently, correct? Right, right. And so you're saying that there's no way for just this one expression of creation to have taken place statistically within that time period, given the immensity of the probability. The odds are always better that it didn't happen by chance than that it did, and they're immensely in favor of that it didn't. It's, it, the probabilities are so small. And what's happening and so exciting inside the black box, so to speak, is what we're seeing is that scientists, everywhere they go, they keep seeing more and more overwhelming evidence that there is just no way that this could have evolved or happened. The numbers are so grand, it takes not just a tremendous amount of faith, but it goes against all reason, all probability, and all really scientific prob uh, possibility that it could have happened that way, and yet they still defend it vehemently. Right, because there are some other possibilities. But l let, me, let me turn the corner from the negative to the positive, okay? And I just want to make you aware. I know David's here. It yep. is 840. 840. And oh. so we need to get him out here. Five minutes, and I'll tell you the end of the story. Uh, okay. okay. All and right. then we'll get him Go out Go for here. it. Okay. I'll stay here All with right. you. There's two other... <laughs> <laughs> and he, he's a big guy. I'm not going to mess with that. <laughs> let, me, let me turn the... There's, there are other possible purely naturalistic approaches. In my studies... I found them equally, e equally inadequate. And if you want to know why, there's a big fat book that we're advertising in the back that's going to be out in June called Signature in the Cell. But I want to tell you the positive side of the story, and this will segue to David, okay? And that is that I, I had an epiphany, when I, because one of the things I want to know is, was Dr. Thaxton right? It, could this be made a scientific conclusion, the idea of intelligent design? And when I got to Cambridge, one of the things I began to study was how do scientists reason about events in the remote past? And I found the works of the masters. I found the works of Charles Darwin. And I found the works of his mentor, Charles Lyell. And they had a simple principle, and it was that if you want to explain events in the remote past, you should invoke causes that are known to produce the kind of events that you're trying to explain. Makes sense? You want to explain volcanic ash? Don't invoke an earthquake. Invoke a volcanic eruption, right? And so I, be I one day found the front piece on Lyell's, Lyell's book, okay? And this is what, Lyell, and it, it, it had this amazing subtitle, and, this, and it, it, it put the light on for me. It said, be, uh, principles of ge geology being an attempt to explain the former changes of the Earth's surface by reference to causes now in operation. That's how we gotta go about things. We try to explain things by reference to causes that we know can produce the effects in question. And I asked myself a simple question. What is the cause now in operation for the production of digital code? What is the cause now in operation for the origin of information? I knew that chance, necessity, the combination of the two didn't work. I studied them carefully. Nobody disagreed with me, not even the good Professor Dawkins as late as last year. But there is a cause that we know can produce digital code. That cause is intelligence. We're doing it right now. I'm con conveying information to you. It's maybe not an intelligent design, but at least some kind of mind is behind all this communication. Okay? So what I realized, oddly, was that Darwin's own method of reasoning, where we infer the cause which is known to produce the effect in question is the best explanation of the thing we're trying to explain, that his method actually revived the argument from design. The, the, the data were different, the conclusion is different, but using his method, which I honored and followed, I came to the conclusion that the best explanation of the digital code that's involved in life, the central feature of living systems, has to come from an intelligence. And that is the basis, not of just a critique of evolutionary ideas about the origin of life, but a positive case for intelligent design based on an established scientific method of reasoning, in fact, Darwin's own method. That's my story. Wonderful. All right. Uh, Yeah. All right. I want you all to hang in there uh, because what we're going to do in these next 17 minutes, David Berlinski, who uh, is here with us, uh, is, is going to basically do a little interview right now with Steve. And I want you to stick with this. We're going to do this for about 15 minutes. Then we're going to bring up Mike and, and maybe Ray and do a short Q&A. Are you guys ready? Come on out here, David. Come on out here, Steve. Uh, this is going to be a real treat. If you've, uh, we're going to forego. We're going to forego the video introduction of Dr. Berlinski, and and the reason I want to do that is to maximize our time with him. Let me just recommend that all of you go and watch the movie Expelled, and it it does a great job of introducing Dr. Berlinski. Uh, I'm grateful for his being here. He's come all the way from France. And so, Steve, I'm going to let you have a few minutes with him, and we're going to come back up here and, and crank out some more great time. So That's great. Welcome. Yeah. 
Uh, uh, I'm delighted to have David here tonight. Um, he and I are colleagues at the Discovery Institute. Uh, He's uh, also uh, a friend and advisor. He's the Jewish uncle I never had but always wanted. And uh, we, we've, we are, uh, have had a lot of fun working on this issue together. David has a fantastic book out called The Devil's Delusion, which is out of print. And there's some publishers looking at it, trying to get it back into print. You may have heard a little bit about it this morning. But um, David's background is as a mathematician and as a uh, philosopher. And David, you became skeptical about Darwinian evolution uh, fairly early on, well before, you know, there's a country song down here that says, uh, I was country before country was cool. You were skeptical about Darwin before there was any ID movement, and what, what were some of the considerations that led you to that? Well, let me impart a secret. Um, I, I published my first paper that uh, dealt directly or indirectly with Darwinian evolution in 1973, a long time ago. <clears throat> and I published it directly because I had been thinking about topics in automata theory, machine theory, and uh, I was very much influenced by uh, mathematical linguistics. My great buddy Marco Schutzenberger was a, a mathematician, and uh, Noam Chomsky and Schutzenberger were working together on the description of natural languages by uh, a formal mathematical method. And I tried to apply exactly the same description of certain structures in the English grammar to what I then, in 1973, understood about molecular biological systems. And what did I discover? That it was impossible, not just difficult, but impossible to use the simplest level of ex explanation, so-called finite state automata, where one thing happens after another. Typical Darwinian progression, small incremental continuous improvements in the structure of an organism. As soon as you tried to specify that very rigorously, you discovered, well, it doesn't work. It doesn't look good. It doesn't make sense. What you need is at least, and this was 1973, all this is, is uh, far in the past now, and I'm sure the methods have been um, improved, but I think the conclusion is sound. You need at least what's called a push-down storage automata. You need some forward-looking memory. Let me give you a simple example. You take the English sentence, the old man came, and you can say that sentence is made by first fishing the word the from a vat. And that word determines the next one. It can be old, sprightly, courteous, ancient, whatever. But it determines the next word. And then the, the third word, man, is determined by the second word, and the verb at the end is determined by the third word. Very simple system. It's a very Darwinian system. You can imagine Darwinian evolution producing the sentence, the old man came. Turns out English doesn't work that way. No other natural language does either. For example, the old man who had snorted um, the roses in the hall came. Now listen to the balance of that sentence. The old man, comma, who had snorted the roses in the hall, comma, came. There is no immediate dependence. When you get to the verb, you have to go all the way back to the beginning of the sentence and keep that in memory before you'll understand what the sentence says. That can't be produced by a Darwinian mechanism or a finite state automata. And the great work in this field was done by Noam Chomsky as early as 1958 or 59. It was a revolution in graduate school when I was there. Just amazing. And contrary to what all the behavioral psychologists thought, and behaviorism in psychology is simply Darwinism in psychology. Contrary to what all the people like B.F. Skinner thought, or W.V.O. Quine, a great philosopher, English and no other natural language behaves in this way. You need something like a push-down storage automata for a formal description. And of course, that set my imagination on fire. You had your experience, yeah. I had mine. And I got together with a very good biochemist, George Pachenik, and we were going to publish revolutionary papers and uh, you know, nothing Ruin ever happened. Ruin your careers and yeah. so doing, yeah. yeah. Oh, Pachenik went on to a great career, yeah. but he didn't go on to a great career criticizing Darwin, that's for sure. <laughs> <laughs> He's some big wig in an oil company. Oh, amazing, an oil company. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I'm intrigued by this phrase, uh, forward-looking memory, because one of the things that, that the mechanism of natural selection can't do by definition... No, absolutely is, impossible. ...is, is uh, have foresight. And yet every simulation that's done in a computer of Darwinian evolution seems to require that foresight. Can you it tell us a little bit about that? It is assiduously packed into the simulation itself. I mean, I think we can say as a, as a kind of general principle where Darwinian computer theoretic simula simulations work, they're not Darwinian, and when they don't work, 
What they require, what they require is the addition of forward-looking memory, some capacity to store information about the future. This is simply missing from Darwinian theory. It's absent a concept. There's a hole where there should be something substantial. And it's not a, it's not a trivial hole. It's a very significant hole. Richard Dawkins, uh, I think the two of you have debated in the past, but he has a, a simulation where he attempts to do this, where yeah. he wants the computer to produce the phrase, me thinks it's like a weasel, but uh, yeah, tell yeah. us. Dawk I wrote about this before Dawkins published his stuff, and uh, you know, many, many people were arguing like Dawkins. Dawkins has become the most well-known, in indeed notorious. He took a phrase from Hamlet, me thinks it's like a weasel, and he said, how would... Uh, it's an ironic phrase for Richard Dawkins to use. <laughs> God punishes every man according to a special plan. <laughs> and he said, what would be required in order to um, achieve this sentence from a random group of, of letters or words using just Darwinian principles? And he said, well, Suppose we set up a computer and we r randomly varied a, a, target sen uh, uh, a sample sentence, which was just gibberish, and every time we accidentally came close to the uh, sentence, the target sentence, me thinks it's like a weasel, we would keep those changes and allow the computer simulation to go on until we converge to, uh, to, the, to the target sentence itself. And of course he was able to show with no, great, very, uh, no very great difficulty that indeed uh, using those constraints, you could achieve convergence to a target sentence much more quickly than you could by looking at it randomly. I never understood what, what he was the, up. What's the fallacy in that, though? Just, uh... I'm not sure it's a fallacy because uh, obviously his theory is correct. It's simply not Darwinian because what he has, speaking technically, is a built-in metric, which is just a way of measuring the distance between what he gets randomly and what he needs to get. And speaking informally, he has a fixed goal in mind. Now, not necessarily the goal of that sentence, but if you disregard that goal and say, well, any English sentence will do, the, program, the problem becomes progressively more difficult, not less difficult. Because then you have to build in, build in constraints which will tell you when you've reached an English sentence and when not, and no one knows how to do that. So he's, he's selecting for future function, uh, not actu actual function. There's that's, no that's actual right. function it's, being selected. So it's all taking place in the future. In the future. In the future. As if the computer somehow knows, which, of course, natural selection doesn't know. No, but yeah. the rest of life does. Yeah, the rest of life does, yeah. As one of our colleagues, Paul Nelson, says, if you get it wrong, the life has a way of talking back. It says, hey, I needed that. I yeah, I'm dead. exactly. <laughs> so I published, I published that criticism, and people who understood the discussion agreed with me. Mm -hmm. And, of course, people who didn't, didn't. <laughs> Sava <laughs> uh, David, let's talk a little bit about your, your the, the Dawkins is also known for this uh, book, The God Delusion. There's this whole publishing phenomenon of the new, the new atheism. And you've written this wonderful piece, the, the, the Devil's Delusion, Scientific Atheism and Its Pretensions. So uh, why did you decide to take these guys on? I wrote a book called The Devil's Delusion, Atheism and Its Scientific Pretensions. And uh, the question is, why did I decide to take these people on, I'm assuming that vanity is not the answer you wanted. <laughs> <laughs> but look, we're among friends, right? And vanity is a part, Any, anybody who writes has that as a motive. I'm not, I'm not trying to, uh, uh, to present a false face. It, it's, it's not false humility. Yeah, I wanted to get my name known. I wanted to make a big stir. I wanted to attack these guys. Um, and that is, that is the expression of vanity, nothing else. But I also thought this is an important topic. I still do. And I wanted to register not necessarily a dissident, but a different opinion. And that's what I set about doing in the book. And I think a different opinion, a heterodox opinion, is badly needed because atheism has become, in the secular West, certainly in France and, and in the rest of Europe, I don't know about Eastern Europe, but in, in Western Europe, the United States, it's become the default position among intellectuals. Not only the default position that is instinctively reached, but an unthinking position. Uh, by unthinking, I mean it's not historically informed and it's not analytically informed either. And people who espouse atheism, say over, over cocktail parties or dinner parties at Cambridge or San Francisco or New York, are typically, typically flabbergasted to discover 
that their beliefs uh, are wafer thin and their arguments are generally puerile. And I wanted to say that. <laughs> it was a good time for a dramatic pause just to reflect on that last phrase. That was wonderfully stated. D David I'm sorry, is, I can't see Yeah, D David uh, had a fall and has uh, got a Defeating a terrorist plot. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I happen to trip over my own feet. <laughs> we, we were, I, I was talking a little bit this morning and did in my introduction about the, uh, the, the uh, uh, argument from design based on the anthropic fine-tuning, all this exquisite fine-tuning. And uh, w uh, one of the things that, uh, one of the counter-arguments to that is the idea that there were billions and billions and billions of other universes out there, these various physical models that generate the, what's called the multiverse, and you, you talk in your book about, a bit about the multiverse, and what's your assessment of that as a, as a contrary hypothesis? Well, you need a special scale to rank the multiverse, the scale of the preposterous. <laughs> if the doctrine that uh, we all have parents who are ducks comes in at 100, the multiverse comes in at slightly more. It is one of those strange phenomena in the history of thought. I mean, you see, the most intelligent people on the planet, and that's sincerely meant, these guys who are doing quantum cosmology. They're smart. Very smart, yeah. very smart. Nonetheless, like um, a herd of individuals, they all are instinctively moving toward the same conclusion, which involves embracing any doctrine, hypothesis, or belief other than the most obvious one. It's a remarkable feat, not of indoctrination, not of indoctrination, nobody is forcing these guys to do that, but of um, compliance to a party line. And the party line is, God forbid we should mention anything except a hypothesis that does not invoke a designer or some form of supreme intelligence or some transcendental entity, anything except the obvious one. And they are reacting this way because they've been properly chastened. You know, when the Big Bang hypothesis became more than a hypothesis, when it became part of the settled body of theoretical physics, <clears throat> a great many physicists said, you know, the universe came into existence 15 billion years ago. It sort of erupted into existence from nothing. And some of the physicists with more than a nodding literary acquaintance with the great texts of Western history said, you know, I've heard that before. <laughs> Can't place it, but it's got that ring in the beginning. <laughs> and they began talking amongst themselves. And one of the physicists said to the other, you know, that's something that was written a long time ago, not only in one place, but in every single serious creedal system, there is reference to uh, the event by which the universe was constructed, and it's remarkably similar to what modern physics shows. That was too much for the community of physicists. It was really an indignity. First of all, that a lot of dopey theologians may have anticipated the Big Bang. What an outrage. Chutzpah, as we say in Greek. <laughs> <laughs> that couldn't be. Antaldi. But in the second place, it conflicted with everything the community, the scientific community in the West, took to be their prerogative. They would decide what the physical world looks like. They would answer all questions. To the scientists would repair all inquiring intellects, and anybody who didn't like it, well, just too bad. And here is a conclusion that um, didn't seem quite agreeable. So an incredible amount of effort has been devoted, say, since 1971, 1972. How many years is that? 38, yeah, 37, 30. something, yeah. I don't do that kind of math. <laughs> <laughs> it's okay, neither did Einstein. <laughs> yeah. We're brain workers, we leave that to other people. Yeah. <laughs> An incredible amount of work has been devoted to rejecting this palpable and obvious conclusion. Well, if you find the existence of the universe a remarkable mystery, some, of the, some sense of that mystery can be dispelled if you say to yourself, well, it's not just one universe, there are all sorts of universes lying around out there, loitering as it, will, as it were. And there's nothing mysterious about our universe because any property that we find uh, desperately enigmatic about the world in which we live 
is sure to arise by chance just so long as we have sufficiently many universes to make the play of the dice agreeable. Hence the hypothesis that we live not in the universe, but in one universe, and that there are indefinitely many other universes out there. And that principle, the doctrine of the multi multiverse, multi-universe, goes along with a number of other nonsensical doctrines, the anthropic cosmological principle, for example. And this is not the time, I think, to, to go on an extended exploration of the anthropic cosmological principle, nor the doctrine of the multiverse. My point is otherwise. I think you have a genuine example in the flight of the community of physicists from any confrontation with the obvious to a variety of metaphysical speculations that strain credulity of a, of a relatively familiar phenomenon in the history of thought, that is party line orthodoxy. We've seen it with Marxism. We certainly saw it with Freud, Freudianism. And it continues to this day within the sciences. Very interesting. David, some of these physicists have been quite candid about uh, their oh, reasons yeah. for, for positing this. I bet there's a quote in your book from uh, is it Leonard Susskind. Leonard Susskind is a terrifically smart mathematical physicist at Stanford, you know, very aggressive, uh, Brooklyn-born, um, nothing but contempt for anyone else. He said, you know, if we don't come up with the right scenario, these guys are going to crucify us. And by us, he means the physicists, and these guys, he means people like Steve and me. He's absolutely right. Yeah, if it's not the multiverse, he says it's intelligent design, yeah. and we simply can't have that. No, so, unacceptable. No. So there's got to be billions and billions I, about I, the I universe. Dr. Berlinski mentioned clueless theologian, and I felt like that was my invitation to, to join you all. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure I am the latter, but I'm definitely the you can, former. You can stay standing if you like. Uh, yeah. let, let, me, uh, let me ask this. I, I think the reason we had such a great response, and this is a key question. If you can only hear one, I want you to hear this. I think the reason there was such a tremendous response tonight is because people who have have believed in a, uh, a creation explanation, have been bullied by science for the better part of the last 150 years. They've been told that they are uh, infantile in their understanding, that they're anti-intellectual, and that they believe in a child's fairy tale. So. so what would you say to them? Because clearly we're not scientists, and we cannot enter into a conversation to, to, to tit for tat on science, but to folks that have felt oppressed by this idea that only fools believe in the myth, the God delusion, if you will, what would you say to them? First thing I would say is, so, so what? Infantile, narrow-minded, foolish, childish, okay, so. <laughs> the question isn't whether it is infantile, childish, narrow-minded, whether it's something that one, one uh, could not expect to see in sophisticated circles. Those are points in its favor. Surely we understand that. The question is, what portion of the truth resides in these claims? That's a different question. Okay. Uh, and so what you're saying, though, from a scientific perspective, that the truth is overwhelmingly crying out for this intelligence, this singularity which is intelligent. No, I'm not saying anything from the I scientific didn't think so, perspective. Which is why I asked. Because the, <laughs> There no, what, is no such thing as a scientific perspective. There is only the perspective of informed, commonsensical, rational inquiry. Wonderful. There is no method of science. I mean, nothing that doesn't apply to golf as well. Uh, the whole thing is, is a charade to that extent. It's a structure of considerable grandeur but great emptiness. There are various scientific theories, and our responsibility, and I mean everybody in this audience, me, you included, is to examine these theories and ask ourselves as honestly as possible, do they answer to the deepest needs of men and women? If not, get rid of them. Steve if and Mike? So, yeah, exactly. What's wrong with that? We're looking at certain theories. Uh, Mike Behe's looking at theories in molecular biology. Steve is looking at information. As it's applied to these systems, I have slightly different interests. And if we come up with conclusions that are not entirely uh, consonant or consistent with the standard scientific orthodoxy, tant pis, tough. <laughs> Todd, I think one of the wonderful things about the book that you're holding in your hands, granted it's, 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 it's yeah. <laughs> you can't buy it. And it was interesting, David, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, but the reason this is out of print, usually books go out of print because no one's buying them. No, it's sold out. That's why it went out of print. And so why doesn't the publisher who wants money, why don't they put it back in print? They don't like my associations. Yes. They, in other words, they are embarrassed that this would yeah. be put off as science underneath their... No, they're just embarrassed because of my association with the Discovery Institute. Okay. Simple as that. So what, can, I, can I say something for the book, though? <laughs> sure. <laughs> well, I, I think the short answer to, to your question is we, it, it's time to stop being intimidated. 
And I think the, the, the devil's delusion is a, is a lucid, short, uh, very readable, very funny, but very uh, persuasive and powerful uh, defense of that common sense principle. You know, the, the people that obscure common sense with talk of multiverses and quantum cosmological ideas and, and string theoretic landscapes, uh, it, it, it's time to stop being intimidated by folks like that and ask, well, do these things really make sense? And I think David so. does a masterful job of deflating the pretensions that underlie a lot of that kind of uh, obfuscation. That, that I think Dr. Johnson made the point superbly. You know, he was talking to Boswell and he said, sir, you must clear your mind of Kant. Stop talking rubbish if you can possibly help it. The scientific community talks a lot of rubbish. Look, they're only human. There's nothing wrong with talking rubbish, but there's nothing wrong with pointing out that it is rubbish either. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Uh, I, I want to get this. I don't want to miss it. Steve, earlier you said there's three different de definitions of evolution. A and the second one, I think, created a little bit of a stir when, when the idea that, that we don't have an issue with common descent or common ancestry. And explain that. Does, uh, that doesn't mean that you believe that all of us have come from uh, all the kinds, uh, have come from a similar kind, or does it? I want to let you speak to that. I, I have an issue with, with universal. I think I've got, you got me hooked up, David. But uh, I have an issue with it. I know too much about fossils, for example. Um, <laughs> the major groups of organisms come suddenly into the rock record, uh, the insects, the, 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 the phyla uh, in, in the Cambrian. Um, the, uh, the, the, I used to say to my students, you shall know them by their euphemisms. The Cambrian explosion, the marine Mesozoic revolution, the angiosperm big bloom, the mammalian radiation. Um, I, I don't think there's good evidence for universal common ancestry. But that, the, the point I was making is that that's not what the theory of intelligent design is addressing. We're addressing a different question. We're addressing a more fundamental issue of whether there is or is not design in, in life and in the universe and whether or not you can tell um, from, from the scientific evidence. So there's three facets of Darwinism, change over time, universal common ancestry, and, and the idea that a purely undirected mechanism produces the appearance of design. We're taking on that third, and we think most fundamental and important proposition. That once we get that one settled, the rest of the stuff will fall in place. Mike, do you want to jump in on that at all? Uh, yeah, uh, I, the w reason uh, we focus on just the point of intelligent design, or at least my reason, is that it's the easiest. It's the easiest. If you uh, can remember to my talk, I showed the Far Side cartoon with uh, the jungle trap. And you can ask yourself a whole lot of interesting questions that you'd like to know the answer to. Like, who made that trap? You know, maybe it was native of the jungle, maybe it was one of the explorers. You know, and the, the guy who turned around and said, I wasn't in front, I didn't want to be in front. Or when was it made? Maybe it was made yesterday or a month ago. Uh, so you can ask a lot of who, what, when, where, how questions, and you need more information to answer those. But simply looking at the system right there in front of you, you look at that trap and immediately you know it was designed because the evidence for design is the system itself. The history of the system and so on is, is an interesting question, uh, but you can tell that something was designed just, just by essentially looking at it. And so it's the easiest question to address. It's also the one that the evolutionists, the Darwinists, most want to avoid. They'd be happy to talk about any other question except how in the world could these complex machines and, and systems uh, have come about without intelligence. Because undirected natural cause is the foundation of Darwinian exactly. theory and science. Absolutely. So, Dr. Blinsky? Well, if you'll permit me, I have a slightly different perspective on that question, but I think the question is essential. Um, and just imagine you're walking in the desert, right? and you're walking with a Darwinian biologist, and you come across a termite mound. You know, termite mounds are fairly complicated structures. They have many tunnels. They have elaborate construction. You say to the bar Darwinian biologist, eh, how, how did that come about? And he says, well, the termites made it. Good answer. The termites did make it. The termites are perfectly capable of making termite mounds. You go a few, a few miles further, and you come across a nuclear fusion reactor. The massive thing sitting there in the desert, gleaming pipes, ducts, ceiling, waterworks, producing steam, generating electricity. And you turn to the Darwinian biologist and uh, you say, you know, here we are in the desert, there's a nuclear fusion reactor. How did that come about? And the guy says, well, termites made it. 
you know that's not the right answer. <laughs> you just know that's not the right answer. But the interesting case, the interesting case is one intermediate between these two. You're in the desert again, and you see something. Aren't you all I'm going to tell you? You see something. And you turn to the Darwinian biologist and said, how did that appear? And the guy says, it was the Darwinian process. What's wrong with that answer? Which is the answer that has been classically given by Darwinian biology. What's wrong with that answer is the description, I saw something, is not complete enough. It's not specific enough so that any answer is logically possible. In that sense, when Darwin proposed a mechanism for evolution in 1859, he was looking through the wrong end of the telescope because we have not, 150 years later, been able to specify the structures in the cell with that degree of sophistication and precision that would enable us to say, yes, that was a Darwinian process. Darwin was looking through the wrong end of the telescope, so are Darwinian biologists. The question that Darwin attempted to solve may be perhaps solved in 500 years. Now is not the time when it admits of a solution. We have not been able scientifically or rationally to describe the structures that we see, certainly not in molecular biology. The only honest thing that we can say is they're stupefying in their complexity. But if they're stupefying in their complexity, we cannot characterize that complexity. There is no theoretical model that is adequate to the task of explaining their emergence. That's a logical point. I think it's a powerful point. And what you're saying is you don't need to be a scientist to grasp that. It is in your face, and in fact, all the mountain of words and theory does is obscure the obvious. I think that's largely true. Anybody who's looked in the eyes of an infant knows that's true. No way to characterize the intelligence that one sees there. Can I cue David up on another aspect of this common ancestry question? Um, the poster child of uh, transitional intermediate forms in Darwinian biology today is the, the um, transition from a, 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 a hippopotamus-like land-dwelling creature to uh, the, the modern whale. And uh, uh, David has asked some, I think, penetrating questions about the plausibility of that having to do with the anatomical changes that would be required. What, what could you say about that? I, I, I've been thinking about this and, and uh, remarking casually about this for about 20 years, ever since I first heard this incredible scenario that the whale, a huge big thing, lives in the ocean, had its origins in some dim, dweebish, uh, land-going, uh, grass-munching creature I said on the internet once it was probably a cow, and everybody, oh, no, what do you know? It's not a cow at all. It's a moose. I don't care what you call it. The question is, what does it take to transform a land-dwelling creature into a sea-dwelling creature? Or, if you want an analogous question, what does it take to transform a 1976 Chevrolet Camaro into a submarine? <laughs> it's the same question. Yeah. It's the same question. Or an ape to a man? No, this question is, more, is more, more specified because we have a much better intuition about the changes. We know just what it would take to take a Camaro and make a submarine, a whole lot of work. But my question wasn't that this story was plausible or implausible. I have no interest in that question. My question was rather, do we have any quantitative measure of the number of changes, just anatomical changes? After all, we take a cow or a moose, the first thing we've got to do is make it waterproof. How do we go about making a mammal waterproof? Not a simple business. The skin is a complicated organism. How do we teach it to breathe 500 miles under the water? How, how far would down the whales go? I'm in the ballpark, right? How do we get its blow spout or whatever those things use to the top of its head from the bottom of its head? How do we, give, how do we persuade this creature to give up eating grass and go munch whatever whales munch? Can we come up with a numerical estimate of the number of changes? And I said, you know, I have no idea. These are very complicated questions in morphology and uh, comparative anatomy. But I was able to say, well, you know, back of the envelope, about 50,000. <laughs> say it's wrong. Say it's 5,000, 500,000. I don't know, but you don't know either. The point is... <laughs> The point is, when you go to the paleontological textbooks, the question, how many fossils do we see that fit this pattern? And how many fossils might we expect rationally to fit this pattern? That question is never asked. Never asked. You go to the, the leading experts on chordate uh, paleontology, James Carroll, a wonderful scientist. I looked through his textbook, yeah. I understand there are all sorts of intermediates like Ambulocetus natans that have been discovered, and those are wonderful confirmations of Darwinian theory. There is an intermediate sequence, but there are only seven of them. 
If there are 50,000 changes, what happened to the remaining 49,000 changes that should be in the fossil record? Can we explain that away? Is it plausible? It is plausible. My point is the, que the question is not properly asked. It's a sign of intellectual flabbiness in Darwinian theory, one of many. Okay, guys, we're going to end at 9.15. We're going to make ourselves more available. I want to say we're going to throw Ray to the lions. Here we've got this panel of three, <laughs> and then it's going to be Ray alone on Tuesday. So you're going to have all those text messages to chew through and, yeah. and get after it. But Ray is a very capable scientist and uh, philosopher and able to do that with us. Now, here's the last two questions I want to ask. Uh, one, what is the best argument against intelligent design? Look around. <laughs> People, is that what you're saying? Yeah. The world. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, go ahead. Well, Mike. the argument from evil comes up yeah. quite a bit. One, yeah. and, and, and one of the things that's not, well, go ahead, Mike, are you going to expound on that? Yeah, why, why did my mother die? I've had people ask me that, and they say, you say that this was designed. My mother died of cancer last year. How could that be designed? Yeah. How could an intelligent, especially a benevolent designer, as the Christian would represent, or the theologian, be any part of this design? So it's a really a question of theodicy, uh, more than it is a question of uh, creation. They're of, they're of a part, these questions. Uh, we find it very difficult to reconcile ourselves with the world as it is. There's no question that as human beings we do. Mm. Mm. Sin and suffering are overwhelming. We were talking can today. I, can I take a, a stab at that from, uh, about the rhetorical Please. framing of that? Uh, the, the, that question is put to us, obviously raises a theological question. There's an artificial restraint on the debate that says that anything that has a theistic implication is not scientific. You know, so people are, they, they think when they raise that question that it's a kind of a gotcha for anyone who's in favor of intelligent design. But I think to answer that, you have to bring in a theological perspective. And I think the, the uh, Judeo-Christian biblical perspective is that you ought to expect two things in life, not one. You ought to expect evidence of design, but you ought to expect evidence of decay as well. There's something wrong with the world that wasn't intended. And if, you, if you're artificially pre uh, prevented from, from, uh, from, from giving a theological answer to what is in essence a theological question, then the ID perspective always looks deficient. But if we get rid of that artificial restraint and say, we're going to follow the truth wherever we happen to find it, whatever disciplinary heading it falls under, whether that's science, philosophy, theology, I think there are, there, there are reasonable, coherent uh, uh, perspectives but on that. There's an even better answer. It's an answer to the question, why is man's lot so miserable? Where wert thou when I created the universe? <laughs> yeah. So you're saying the, the question that God himself asked to Job, where yeah. art thou? And so who is this that darkens counsel with words yeah, without exactly. knowledge? Exactly. That will do as well as any other answer, right? I mean, there, there are questions we can't answer. Yeah, it's interesting. One of the other famed uh, neo-atheists uh, today is, we've already mentioned him, is Hitchens, Christopher Hitchens. And I was recently in a room with Hitchens where he himself said, uh, to your point, Steve, uh, leaving the discussion about evidences for origins, if I was going to suggest there's a problem with it, your designer, it's the way that he lets this world drift to decay. But he said, I would agree that if the Christian story was proven to be true, it gives a compelling an acceptable explanation for the problem of evil, a congruent explanation of which I provide no other. But because I reject the Christian explanation, I therefore reject the whole thing out of hand. But he himself acknowledges if the theistic answer is true, it does answer the question that's presented to Logically intelligent design. Coherent. It's yes, amazing some coherent. of the, con the concessions that uh, are, are granted on the ride home from the debate with these guys. <laughs> I mean, I could tell you some interesting stories. Um, so the, the difference between the podium presentation and the, what, what one of my students called the four o'clock in the morning questions. They have them too. Yeah. That's true and for every participant in the debate. Yeah. Everybody feels the same way. What we say in public, we say with enormous confidence. What we say to ourselves at four o'clock in the morning is full of <laughs> doubt and uncertainty. So let, me, let me just do this. To honor your time and theirs, uh, let's just join them in an expression of thanks for their stewardship of life and time this evening. Um, <clears throat> Yeah, gentlemen, I, I think the response that you're getting right now is, is really uh, an expression of, I think, the relief that, that 
Uh, Dr. Williams, you said you shouldn't feel this. I mean, trust yourself. Uh, don't let us overcomplicate things that are self-evident. Look at the baby, which is really an argument from Psalm 139 that you can see what is there. But I think what you're hearing us say is you guys can look through telescopes and microscopes that we cannot and have discussions on a field which we are not welcomed into. And what you're saying is even there, you have no reason to shrink back. And that is our expression of thanks for your serving well on a portion of the battlefield that we have not been asked to march. I would encourage you to take advantage of the work that these men have done through the devil's delusion, through the signature of the cell, through Darwin's black box, Find these materials, avail yourself to them, use their arguments, and let them argue with their PhDs. Let them argue with the Nobel scientists that are on the descent from Darwin list and others that themselves have made the case that you cannot make from a lack of investing and stewarding your life that way. You have gifts, you develop them, and you put them to work as these men had, and others will be as encouraged by you as you have been by them this evening. So may they stand before you and applaud you for your faithfulness, for being effective in the battle that you are in. And again, men, we want to thank you and uh, express our heartfelt thanks by both reading and learning from your materials, uh, making ourselves uh, attentive to them, and by laboring in our part of the battlefield. One last time, we thank you for coming. And uh, we'll see you on Tuesday. And uh, thank you. Have a great evening. Bye-bye.